Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the CG Show. With me here today, Nathan Birch, the founder of Be Invested. He offers his expertise and time to guide property investors and individuals seeking to establish a profitable investment property portfolio. He has 230 plus properties in his property portfolio, which has led to his early retirement at the age of 24. Nathan's reputation is built on his direct involvement in assisting 1,700 plus investors to achieve a portfolio of six or more properties. He's well known for his no bullshit approach, his popular YouTube videos, and his growing list of media appearances. Nathan, thank you for joining me. Thanks, Christian. Appreciate you having me on the show. It's um, it's interesting. We, we talked a little bit off camera, but just a bit of a backstory. I obviously stumbled across you somehow seven years ago. I think it was in a in in the crypto mining space, and you know, I kind of followed your your journey. Uh, you know, for for yeah, for six or seven years, and then uh, you came across me again, and I was like, you know what, this is this is probably the right time just to reach out and try and organize a bit of a bit of a catch up with you to discuss, you know, your journey, but then also uh, just property in general. I, I feel like obviously you've got a lot of knowledge. Um, you purchase property all around Australia and, you know, the, the Australian dream is for every, everybody to own a, a property and they all want investments. And, you know, we, I'll just use Melbourne for an example. We're so, I know a lot of people that we all just stick to our own backyard, but, I'm sure you're about to tell us that there's better investment opportunities if you look into states. So <laughs> we'll start yeah. with uh, we'll start with just sharing your journey and how did you get started in property investment? How, how did you build a business around it? Yeah, awesome, Christian. Well, thanks for having me on. And one thing you said there about the Australian dream, right? And that's because most people are asleep, right? They need to wake up and you know, yeah, live in the dream, right? And, and, and take action. So. <laughs> Uh, how I got into property, um, it all started, I was like 13 years old. Um, I retired at the age of 24. Um, I'm 38, I just turned 38 last week. Getting older with a face full of grey hair now. I need to be in face full of pimples when I first started the business. Full of wisdom. That's it, that's it. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, I grew up in Western Sydney. I didn't have a bad upbringing. Everyone thought I grew up in like a, a rough area and stuff like that. I've got none of those stories to share. But I grew up in just like an average, hardworking household. Uh, my father died at the age of 62, old, 16 years old. Um, at the age of 13, I saw one of my older brothers buy a property and I was like, I want to buy a property. And I saw what hard work was. My family was just, you know, hardworking and getting ahead and stuff. And I was like, I don't want to have to work 40 years of my life in a job that I hate. Uh, my options in life, everyone was trying to force me to go to university and stuff. And I couldn't even get good grades at school. So I was like, well, I don't want to go and do a Pledge of Allegiance for another four years doing something that's commie and not 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 going to be happy and fulfilled in my life. So yeah. I um, actually, the funny thing is I actually had a scholarship where they'd pay me 25 grand a year uh, between the age of 16 and the age of 25 if I did education. And my mum tried to incentivize me. She goes, what sort of car do you want? And I thought a Honda S2000 was cool back then. Yeah. Well, a Honda S2000. And uh, she goes, I'll give you that car if you go to university. I was like, yeah, Park, I'm not going to go go to university because yeah. like that's not for me, right? And uh, I could have had it all paid for, but I, I didn't. And um, I, I just thought when my brother was, when I was 13, my brother would have been, he's like 13 years old, so he would have been like 26, 27 buying his first property. I thought about it, I thought the average income in Australia at the time was about 40 grand a year, 50 grand a year. This was like late 90s. And I thought, wow, like, you could find a property I saw in the magazines. There was no internet back then. There was no, you know, computers were on a bloody sort of thing, right? And um, uh, funny thing is, you said about crypto. My job in life, I wanted to work in IT, right? I just wanted to be in IT, and I never went to do that, right? But pass across in the in the future. But um, with um, with my brother's position, I was like, how could you buy a property for like? People are paying 250, they get 200 bucks a week and it didn't work out. But I saw you could buy properties for like 60 grand, they rent for 200 bucks a week. And I thought, well, if I just work hard from 13 to 18, I'd have 50, 60, 70 car to buy a property for you know that price and I could have the income coming through. If I could just have um, four or five of those properties owned outright, I could live off that and not need to go to work. So I worked hard between the age of 13 and 18, worked two jobs, worked in the family business selling goldfish 
there's an aquarium, funny enough. Not, not like Juice Bigelow, but yes, that type of shop. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just saved up all my money. But what I realized is I couldn't sign a contract before the age of 18. And uh, in that period of time, I realized that the properties from 60 grand went to 100 grand, went to 200 grand. They were like 250K to buy in Sydney at the time that I bought my first property. And, uh, I'd seen them go up in value and I couldn't do anything. I just kept saving. And uh, I bought my first one when I was 18. And I thought if I could just buy 10 properties by the age of 30, that gave me 12 years, two years of screwing it up and 10 years of buying one property a year. Uh, 10 properties, I should be able to retire at 30. So I just worked hard and did whatever I could. I didn't believe myself that I could do it, but that was my goal. And uh, at the age of 21, I had like seven properties at, at that point. Um, and at the age of 24, I had about 18 properties and I was able to retire from the workforce. And uh, at the age of 25, I had 25 and I got bored. I had a bit of an ego when I was younger. So I was filming videos before like YouTube had just come out and I was filming videos asking people if I was to sell an education product, would you buy it? And I just wanted to build, be invested as an education business. And um, people are like, I don't care about how you, like, good sounds good, the information, but how do you buy a property for eight grand? How do you buy a property for a hundred grand? Everything's three, four hundred. And people wanted to pay me to buy those properties. And then I had the media come behind me and they're like, oh, tell us about your story, how you got retired at 24 and went in the media a lot. And um, then it sort of just grew from there. And now, I own, yeah, over 200 properties, like just normal properties. I've got um, 30 motels and pubs I bought in the last three years. Um, right. Australia's fastest growing uh, motel and, and holiday business out there. Um, I've got 100 of staff and uh, I run Australia's probably largest buyer's agency. Um, 14 years ago, I started the business. There was no such thing as a buyer's agent. And um, I've been a part of over 15,000 real estate transactions over those years. And I still, to this day, actively, every property that comes through for my clients, I buy the properties myself. I locate them, negotiate them, make those deals happen. And very hands on in the business. So. Nice, nice. That's, uh, mate, you, jack of all trades, literally fitting it all in. Why not? If you're, if you're obviously yeah. able to do it for yourself and then people are interested, then it's it's a bit of a no-brainer to open up the service and like you said 14 years ago barely there was barely any there was barely any buyers advocates now i know it's it's big in sydney but in melbourne okay there are a fair few but it's still not wild so i can't imagine what it was like 14 years ago well the, the conversation is used to go like this right they'll be like how oh, can you be my like how do you get those properties and be like well here's the fee you just paid like whatever it was, it's cheap back, though it's still cheap now, I've got to review my fees, but like, it's like six grand or something. And people were like, six grand to buy a property? As if I'd pay you six grand, I'm like, well, go do it yourself then, right? I was making you 50K, 100K, like, <laughs> you know, I don't get paid from any developers of that. And um, nowadays when people speak to my team, they're like, okay, so what do you charge for your buyer's agency fees? So I think like I've literally in the last decade seen the whole industry grow around the business and you know we were one of the first there was no one out there really doing it back in the day and um nowadays people are like okay so what do you charge and like you know it's just it's funny to see it going yeah it's interesting yeah, it's it's wild like being being a real estate agent obviously I, I get to see what people buy their properties for and then obviously they go and sell it and you know, not 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 everyone but a lot of them don't make money or you know they yeah. they they lose money because um you know they they don't really know what they're buying they're not experienced they just kind of like oh they see tv and you know if the property market if we buy something we're going to make a whole lot of cash and then they put the money down they're holding it for five years and they're looking back saying it's given me more headaches than what it's worth so um exactly. yeah and it's it's obviously you know people you know the average person isn't you know educated um you know in every in every market they kind of just look next door in what's going on in their own suburb or maybe the suburb up and um they kind of just run with it so um i think it's extremely uh important to if you don't really know what to do like just getting getting contact with buyers buyers agents and even even someone like yourself that's that's got a that's got a crazy resume that you know nine times out of ten nine point probably more i don't even know what the stats would be but i'm sure if they come to you and you're going to offer them something they're going to they're going to be making money <laughs> yeah. looking at it like 
I've looking through all the data, like I said before, I've been a part of over 15,000 transactions. Like I would have seen like 100,000 properties minimum, right? Over the years that I've assessed, uh, it just daily I go through so many. And um, I would say probably 80 to 90% of people don't make money from property. They're selling a property either at a loss or they've bought it. They might be thinking I've made a hundred grand, but if I go back and reverse engineer and go, well, you bought it for 400, you sell it for 500, you bought it for 200, you sell it for 300, but the out of cost expenses for holding it for 10 years, they haven't yeah. made money. So yeah. um, for me, like I had a lot of things against me when building my portfolio, I had interest rates nearly 10%, uh, rental returns, which were diminishing, uh, cash flows were really bad out there. And um, yeah, looking at it at that point, I had to come up with a strategy that sort of worked because not everyone can get, there's a big difference between someone getting one or two properties or someone getting 10 or 20 properties. And that extra zero, you know, is a strategy that, that goes behind it. And I think you know, if you're buying something that's below market value, it's fantastic. If you're buying with growth potential, great. Everyone wants to have growth and all these things, but they don't look at what drives that growth. They don't look at, what happens if I have to hold this for five years to make the money? Um, and that's even if you believe in money, right? I, I hate money, right? I, I like assets because the money becomes worthless. And I understand how inflation works because if inflation eats away your money, then it makes the debt that you've got to repay even cheaper to repay it because it's nothing at the end to pay. And um, I think having a strategy is really important and having a purchasing sort of model which works like some people go out and go I want to buy a house on land I want to build a granny flat I want to do this I want to do that ultimately it's keeping the banks happy if the banks are happy to keep giving you money the more assets you can buy and the bigger the portfolio so uh, it's never about the property the property is just a byproduct and I think when you look at property from that perspective um, that's where more people become a lot more successful because they're, they're making money from day one. If you're buying a property for like properties today in 2023, at the time of recording this, you can buy stuff for 160, 170 grand, readily available out there across Australia um, and in capital cities. They rent for 300, 350 a week. So they're 10, 15 percent yields today. Interest rates have gone up. Who cares about interest rates? Go up? I want the interest rates to go up because it means that I can push the rents up higher. Yeah. Okay. That's crazy. Like you compare like just Melbourne residential property, you're getting a return of I don't know, three, three and a half percent, like nothing, nothing wild. And then you got like industrial property um, that's kind of returning four and a half, five percent. And everyone's like, yeah, oh, this is, this is wild. So um, when you, when you I throw on those, when you throw on those figures around, it's like, fuck, it's pretty crazy. Here's a funny thing. Like everyone knows like from, from myself, I'm, like for me buying in Melbourne, I'm not a fan of Melbourne. It's nothing to do with Melbourne. I just don't buy there, right? But yeah. I actually bought something that was um, the other week in Melbourne. It was about six kilometres from Melbourne CBD. It was a unit, like a residential unit, $150,000. Comparables in the same block selling for two sixty, two eighty. dollars needed a rental of like 20 grand and rent for three forty dollars a week. Wow. Okay. For one not a studio unit, not one of those commercials. It was a proper residential. And it was like that's a 10% crazy. yield. Yeah. That's crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See, they, they exist. The gems exist. You just got to be looking. You got to be hunting. Wow. Exactly. That's, that's, that's insane. Six, six case from the city as well. Not bad. I'll send you the, after the recording, I'll send you the link to it just so you can have yeah, a look. Yeah, I'm keen to have a look. I'd be very keen to have a look at that. Yeah. Well done. And uh, just yeah. for anyone listening, like what's some specific strategies? Or approaches have you found most uh, most effective in achieving success? You know, as yeah. a property investor. So, probably the biggest thing, like I like to break things down. And you said before, and you saw me talking about crypto like seven years ago, or that. And uh, I think like a lot of people get into crypto just for the, you know, oh, I'm going to make some quick bucks and stuff like that, right? But if you realise the underlying fabric of society, our money that we use is you know, bad, right? And everyone has faith in it and confidence in these dollars that we use and um, <laughs> we fake money. Uh, if you look at the government as a country now, I won't get too political, go too much on tangent. The government's now in a trillion dollars of debt. Uh, the US government's in 31.6 trillion. We're about to see them default or have to raise that to 50 trillion. Literally, they have to pay they have to take out a new loan to pay their interest now. It's getting that far out of control. 
Um, this money was just created from nothing, right? And I, I saw an, an interview with uh, Peter Costello, the old treasurer from 10, 15 years ago the other day, and he said that it was him talking, and you can find it on YouTube, I, I, I assume. Um, uh, he says to someone in an interview on a podcast that the, the, the debt, of the country being a trillion dollars worth of debt at 1% interest rate is very good, right? But when the interest rate's now 4%, it's gone from $10 billion a year of interest that we're paying to $40 billion a year of interest. So $30 billion a year of extra interest repayments, right? Um, he said that's the size of Medicare as a nation. So everybody's health system, the hospital system, everything, size of that. Um, and it's the fastest growing debt to the government. The fastest growing area of government is spending, is debt. So when you look at the way that the monetary system is set up, you can see that inflation is running rampant. With everyone in property thinks, oh, I'm the best investor out. I could sit here and say I'm the greatest investor. I realize that the monetary system is screwed. And when you realize that inflation is your best friend, whenever, if, if inflation is rampant, anything but money is good. So any asset you can take through inflation will just go up in value. So um, for me, I want to have as many assets that I can go up in value. And people just think two-dimensional, they go on to buy a property or whatever. Yes, you can have a property that goes from 500 grand to a million bucks, but if you don't service the bank, then that's where the story ends. I would rather see, okay, what does the bank require from me? Keep them happy by giving them the cash flow, the equity, the growth and all that. You know, well, if I can take $5 million, double that to 10 million, that's, that's where the fun is. So understanding how money works and then how debt works is very crucial for being successful in property, I believe, because not enough people have a great enough uh, relationship with money. But when you realize that they can just keep printing money into existence and debt keeps going into existence, what are the best assets? So I think buying properties that are below rebuild cost, fantastic. So if you can buy something for 200 grand, doesn't matter if it's in a capital city or wherever it is, um, it needs to have demand, needs to have growth. There needs to be drivers economically to it. But I want to buy things that are below market value. I want to buy things when they're on sale and cheap. Um, buying a property just because an area, like if we look at the Gold Coast, for example, at the moment, I used to buy about 50 properties per month for about seven years. Over a seven year period, I was buying about 50 properties a month in the Gold Coast for my investors and for myself. Um, those things went up from like 180, 200 to like five, 600 grand now. Wow. People are looking now at the Gold Coast going, I want to buy in the Gold Coast because it's had all this growth to it. And I'm like, that's dumb. You're buying it with so much risk that could fall off a cliff. Um, the, the downside risk is massive and the upside, what's it going to do? Go from 600 to 1.2? If you look at the average household, look at the average income, the income wouldn't service for a $1.2 million purchase. So they can't get the debt. So the price is sort of capped at that level. So I'd rather look at an area and there's lots of areas in the country, whether it be Perth or some other large regions. I'm not just using the Perth, just something came out of my head just then. Brisbane, there's some areas around Brisbane. It could be far north Queensland, very active in far north Queensland. You can buy a property which for like 180 to 200 grand today, they used to sell for 400 grand or 300 grand going back uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So being a contrarian investor, I'm like, okay, what happened 10 years ago for that to be cheaper? And what could the growth be like in the future? So um, if, if someone was paying 350 grand for a place in 2010 and in 2023 you buy it for 200 yes interest rates have gone up to five percent instead of three percent but 10 years ago interest rates were like eight percent 12 years ago they're eight percent right so interest rates are cheaper than what they were at that point cost of building's gone up inflation's gone up the rents have gone up from 200 to 400 a week um, there's a lot of pent up demand for that to take off, but just hasn't taken off yet. So I'm wanting to find areas which have good growth. I want to find areas that have a, a neutral to positive cash flow attached to them. Um, I want to find properties that are ideally below the rebuild cost. So then you know that if anyone else wants to build into that area and it costs 500 grand, then it's going to drag that value up. Um, and yeah, it's just certain drivers. When I can look at an area, I can go, yep, that, I know most suburbs, like I could rattle off suburbs across Australia, like 
What's that song like? I've been everywhere, man. Yeah. Like that song. <laughs> well, I'm off, right? yeah. Um, but yeah, I want to buy things of intrinsic value, and and, and that's you now it takes is so many. Like, how many people would it take to build a house? Right? Let's say you've got a house, a unit, whatever. It might take three brickies, uh, ten carpenters, five plumbers, three electricians, whatever. It takes about maybe 30 people to build that house. And how much is their wage worth to contribute to that? Um, so when you're buying a property, you're buying X amount of human hours worth of capital to build that thing. You're buying the natural resources, the copper in the walls, the copper piping, the copper, the electric cabling, everything. And um, that's what's going up in value, which I think is you know, really important to factor into the equation. So, yeah. What what are you, what are you looking to identify in, in suburbs? So are there any specific indicators or factors you look for? Yeah, um, I don't want to buy in any hot market. I don't want to buy in a hot market. Um, yeah. And some capital cities have split markets, right? So if we look at Sydney, for example, at the moment, uh, the last few years there's been no migration. Um, so there's some very densely populated migrant areas, right? And they've suffered because there hasn't been the support of incoming people to live in the properties. Um, interest rates have been cheap, so people have been buying the property instead of renting. So there's been a downward pressure on some of these areas. So if you look at Sydney, they say Sydney's average price has doubled in the last few years or whatever. Um, but if you look at the specific locations, I can buy units that are like 10 k from Sydney CBD for 320 green that used to sell for 450 in 2016. Right? Those things, the rent dropped to like 250 a week. But now they're five hundred dollars a week. So if you're buying for three hundred grand for five hundred bucks a week, the rents a positive cash flow like a hundred bucks a week after all expenses. And those properties used to sell for one hundred and twenty grand more than what we're paying today. So um, I want to look for areas that are soft. I want to look for areas that I can go in and be more aggressive on negotiation. Um, I had a I have a mate who's an agent on the Gold Coast, and he had a property recently that had termite a termite nest in the roof wow. and i was like oh when the buyer falls over i'll buy it and do a deal on it he goes mate he goes you're not going to do a deal he goes i've got new buyers that'll sign a contract cash unconditional no pest and building no nothing for 50 grand over the asking price They're like what's stupid right so wow. i don't want to get involved with stupidity like that because then um if 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 you're heated you you know, people act irrational, FOMO and stuff like that. So, um, very strategic with with, the, with with what I'm looking for in a property. I know so, it's like the it's like this it's the human psychology of like okay. So I'm just thinking if my first glance, if I was looking at something where let's just say it sold for it was they were selling for 400 and then 10 years later now they're at 270. My first indication is like you get this weird scared feeling, and that's just yeah. that's just uh, human emotions, I guess. But how do you look at it? How do you look at it? Because 97, 98% of people are looking at it like, I'm not going to go near this because it's probably going to continue to go down. How do yeah. you look at it and say, this is like, this is exactly what I, this is exactly what I'm looking for. Like, what is it about, you know, something? And there, it could be, I don't know, it's something that you're reeling off a property, you know, that you've probably got a good example to share about or, or something yeah. like was it amenities was it did you read yeah. something about like say you know construction that was happening within that suburb or like yeah. what are you what are you generally looking for in that instance so i'm not so i had someone ask me recently about the average wage has gone up the average house price what would you say about now the average is hard to do it was something like that in a conversation forget it exactly i remember stopping the guy that was asking the question i said I'm not an average investor. I don't want an average result. I want a result that's going to get me somewhere, yeah? And everyone just follows, oh, yeah, that's great. It's easy to forget. Like, I was the only buyer out in the Gold Coast for a decade when everyone said it was shit, right? And the Gold Coast, people forget very quickly that it was bad or whatever. They just want something, right? So I see that as the opportunity because people are more desperate, they're open to negotiate better, etc. But um. The way, the simple way that I look at it, if there's a few parts to break it down to, 
if someone the basic part if someone was stupid enough 10 years ago to pay 100 grand more it's going to wait for that idiot to come back again and pay it again right okay. what caused the market to crash what caused that scenario to happen what potential could make it go up and um how does that play into the, the situation and i actually i've got this client of mine uh and without giving all the details of a portfolio and stuff like that. She got 19 properties um, in the last three years. Uh, nice. in mid, like just a standard Australian salary, it's nothing stupid. She started with $80,000. She's probably been able to save maybe 50 grand, 40, 50 K a year for the last three years. So all up maybe 200, 250 K she's invested in total. Um, but the properties have come from equity and cash flow. We need to get the cash flow to keep the bank happy and equity to, um, to, to keep buying. But I'll run through the first four properties of hers because the fourth one is exactly something crazy like what we're talking about here. So her first property, um, she had 80 grand and she wanted to get 100 grand a year income and I reverse engineered what the goal was that she wanted. And um, I thought 100 grand a year income, that's two grand a week. If the average rent 300 bucks, you're going to need like seven or eight properties owned outright. If you get 10, you know, they go up, you can sell off a couple, pay out the debt. Um, you know, if you get 15, even better. Um, 15 properties and you push rent up 100 bucks a week, it's 1500 bucks a week, oh, 78 yeah. grand a year. My head's like a human calculator. So <laughs> I just, and um, yeah, so that was just my mindset behind it. She was a bit nervous. So we started with two, uh, 80 grand. I bought her a unit in the Gold Coast for uh, 200. Um, and I bought her at the same time for 150, a two bedroom townhouse in Brisbane. And uh, just putting it in perspective, like everyone just got put in the lockdown, um, you know, all these things coming out that were very weird. Everyone's fearful. Um, and it wasn't because of that we got these properties so cheap. That's just what I was paying all through that time and for years beforehand. Um, we bought them, so 350 grand in total purchase. The rent on them were like 303. 320 for the Gold Coast, 300 for the Brisbane at the time. Um, so 600 bucks a week rent, 620 a week. And uh, yeah, it was just a, two good properties. She settled them. Uh, she settled on a Thursday. I spoke to her on a Saturday. I, she called me, I answered, we spoke. And I said, hey, I think your property is worth like 250 the first one. Let's see what our finance company can do. We revalued those two properties. So 200 we revalued for 255. Um, and the 150 we revaved 190 straight away, like within a nice. week, sort of thing. That's crazy. Yeah. And um, so if we break it down, the 55 grand equity and 40 grand equity, that's 95 grand equity. 95 grand equity at a 80% loan uh, would be 76 grand that she got back. So she started with 80, she got 76 grand back pretty quickly. Those properties were positive cash flow, so they keep the bank happy. They're wiping their own nose. They've got heart, lungs, and those respiratory systems look after themselves. And um, we took the 76 and bought two more. Uh, the next two properties, the, the next two properties of um, the next two properties that we bought uh, was $130,000 in uh, in Perth, in the city. Um, a bit like that one I just mentioned of for 150 in Melbourne. Um, 130,000 we paid. Um, Revaded straight away for 200, 200 grand, um, the 70 grand up in equity straight away. 80% uh, of the 70 grand was 56 grand. That was her deposit for property number five. And I saw in her position that she was going to get stuck with finance when she got to number seven or eight in her portfolio. So I wanted to try and instead of her having to work a second job or do something crazy to have to you know, get more money. I found a property, it's in a place called South Headland. Anyone can go look that up now. It doesn't really matter because whatever. Um, South Headland is a mining town, iron belt up in far north Western Australia. Uh, it was a three bedroom townhouse. Previous sales in the block were $600,000. Rent was $1,600 per week. And uh, we picked it up for 59,000. And uh, my thought behind that, and verbatim, basically, the words that I was having with her, because she was scared. She bought the first three, she was fine with the third. Like, the first three were in capital cities. This fourth one was regional, right? And I said to her, look, people had paid for this thing beforehand, 600 grand in the same complex. 
you're buying it for 59 grand it rented for 200 dollars per week the expenses were about 250 so even if you bought it cash it would still be negative cash flow 50 bucks but i saw something greater than that i thought the rent was too cheap uh we could push the rent up to say 320 350 and then when idiots come back in the market and pay 600 again sell it because they've paid it before take the profit and pay out your first three properties and she goes okay so we bought that property um we we didn't revalue it didn't pull any equity so she only bought it for 80 percent loan so maybe 48 grand debt roughly um instantly increased rent from 200 to uh to 380 a week so you 20 grand a year how the bank looks at that is that she's got a 48 grand debt on the debt side her income's gone up 400 bucks a week 20 grand a year so it boosts up her servicing so she can borrow to buy more property and um uh, my my thought was sell it when it goes up so if we fast forward that was probably two years ago that that deal came through maybe two and a half years ago that came in um so yeah with that property we um my view for that property was that we just flick it on when it goes up again so if we fast forward two and a half years time where we are now that property's gone up uh from uh from 60 grand they're selling for 250 grand minimum in that location for a three-bedroom townhouse yeah the rent on it is now seven hundred and fifty dollars per week. It's what? positive cash flow, five hundred bucks <laughs> a week, right? And what? my view was, after look at the macroeconomics, right? The inflation was going to come, which we saw because of the money spending that they did. Um, inflation has pushed up commodity prices. Iron went up, all commodities went up, gold went up. So these areas are becoming more profitable for the mining companies to pull the stuff out of the ground. So then it had a flow-on effect. So my view still remains on that property in another year or two, whenever those people come that want to spend 500 grand, I'm going to get it to put it on the market, sell it, take the profit, pay out the loan on those first three properties. The, the Perth property is now worth 300 grand. The Gold Coast property is worth 500 grand. The Brisbane property is worth about 350K. I couldn't tell which property was going to outperform the other back when we bought them, but we needed to obtain those assets. Um, as I said, this chick's at about 19 properties. Um, I actually messaged her the other day on WhatsApp and said, hey, send me a list of all your properties and the current rents on them. And I pushed up her rents across her portfolio by about $850 per week, right? Wow. We've got the scale of the portfolio. We can now push up rents on each one. And they're just $50 here, 30 bucks there. And that's Makes like 40 Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Um, yeah, that's that's really decent <laughs> and, yeah. and you i uh, guess just an average average lady that, you, that you're helping out like it's because yeah. you just know your stuff like it'd be it's very hard for the average person just to to go and find these deals um which is wild what's some like what's some red flags in property yeah. lots of red flags um probably the biggest ones is like there's lots of people out there like properties got like a stigma about it that you know there's all these people with the shiny suits and the cool cars and all that right? <laughs> and, um, with that i a lot of people will come like this there's new properties that sell like they've got a flip book presentation and stuff like that right um where there's a lot of backhanded deals like you i always say treat your property investing like a business treating it like a business is very like I don't buy properties for people to live in. I could, I could have a big buyer's agency that helps people buy properties to live in, but I don't want to deal with the emotions, right? What I do is very logical with numbers. So when it comes to investing, like any business, if you have a business, you don't go, I'm going to employ this person because they're a nice person. You want the best person to do the best job in your organization and get the best results for the business. As a, as a property investor, you want to be buying assets and treating it like a business, it's a piece of stock that you're like, okay, that property needs to perform a certain task. If it doesn't do that, then don't add it in. But I think a lot of people will get emotionally attached. And when you don't, when you get emotionally attached, you leave the numbers out. And it's, you know, it's numbers are crucial. So treat your investing like a business. Um, when you have clarity around what you need, it's like, if you wanted to go on a journey, and I quite often think about, like, if I said, if I said to you, Christian, how does someone get to Perth? What would some, what would you say, and what do you reckon most people would say? Jump jump on the plane to to get over there. 
Exactly, right? Yeah. So firstly, you need to work out where you are yeah. and where Perth is, right? Yeah. yeah. So in <laughs> Sydney, I could walk, I could drive, I could run, I could hitchhike, I could ride a roller skate, so I could do whatever, right? If I lived in New Zealand, I would have to plane it, right? And let's say I had a plane, right? Let's say we catch a plane. I live at the airport, so I need to still catch an Uber, a taxi, yeah. a bus to the airport. So as an investor, I think if you can plan that journey, right, and work out where is it that you're going to, where is it that you're at the moment, and then work out what vehicle and what steps you need to take at any step along the way. We can sit here now and um, and say, look, I'm in Sydney, you're in Melbourne, let's just hop in the car, go for a drive, and it's about two days' worth of driving to get to Perth, right? If we don't have clarity on that journey of going turn left here, turn right there, these are the steps I need to do to get there by reverse engineering, we could drive for the same distance and end up in Cairns, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, Having clarity, having direction, having like a clear plan, you can sort of navigate and avoid decisions, right? And I think so many times in people's life, you can be persuaded via, you know, the nice shiny object, the thing that's glossy or whatever. If you have clarity on it, it all the things that you don't want don't come in your way. You just focused on what you need to do. So red flags, so, um, some properties could be considered as red flags that may not be red flags, right? Like someone could say, oh, the property sold for more 10 years ago. It's a bad investment, right? But at the same time, I think new properties to be careful of because there's, there's like lack of value in some of them. I think any sort of accommodation that you can't control the asset around, um, be it student accommodation, be it um, holiday destination, be it retirement properties, be very cautious of that. Think about what the bank wants from you. So if you're buying a studio unit in a holiday complex, you've got a very small segment of the market. If you're buying a residential or commercial property, there's a lot of people that would want to buy those assets. When you go to the bank, the bank is happy to give you money on the asset. Well, then you should be more aggressive with that. If the bank's not happy to give it, they're using their due diligence to say, hey, that thing's a bad investment either liquidity or buyer pool is not there to support it. So um, I've bought properties, like out of all the properties I buy, sometimes people think because I buy them cheap, they need work done to them. Um, only a few properties would need work. Say maybe 1% of the properties I buy need work. The rest of them don't need work. But if that property was firebombed, if it was termite infested, if it was whatever, there can still be you know good value in that to be had. Um, if you're looking at the condition of the property, I steer clear of properties that don't look straight, right? And what I mean by that is um, you can go and buy an old house that's a cladded house, um, but if you look at the piers, they could have like, there's the houses out there that have piers that are like bloody telegraph poles, right? And you just know that that's gonna add up to money, yeah? <laughs> What's lining the walls of the house, right? Uh, is it old veneer timber panelling? Is it, you know, um, so be cautious of the type of property you're buying. Because uh, it's cheap doesn't mean it's good value. You want to buy something of good value. Um, beware of mutton dressed as lamb, right? Like there's lots of chicks out there that make themselves look pretty, but they, you know, you wouldn't go and want to go and, and marry them, right? Um, Instagram editing is, uh, it's wild out there, Nathan. Exactly. Yeah. And there's so many people that try and renovate a property that's like yeah. that beautiful chick on Instagram and you go and meet her and it's like, look, I've yeah. looked up here. <laughs> what happened here? It's not a good one, right? So, yeah. yeah. That's funny. Uh, even in regards to, do you uh, recommend getting building inspections on every property that you purchase? Yeah, uh, I do, yes. Um, look, my first property on the board um, it had termites in the roof and the pest and building inspector didn't pick it up, right? Whoa. And, yeah. And most people would have got the shits and gone, oh, you know, I don't want to buy a property. I'm like, well, when do I get my next one, right? Of course, yeah. it's brief and whatever. Um, when I look at a pest and building inspection, uh, it always is full of like clauses and protection and disclaimers and stuff like that. Um, so I do take the report with, uh, you know, caution and I do look at it with you know certain things in mind 
I think it's great to have the second opinion to look at the property uh, to make sure that you have got, um, yeah, make sure that you're not, um, I think it's important that like, even if you think that you know everything about a property, you've been to it, you've seen it, you've done all that, you're not an expert in that. So it's important to get a second opinion and what you do with that second opinion is up to you. A lot of people will look at a pest and build and report and run away from it and go, oh, that looks bad because it, they're designed, you're paying someone to rip that property apart. Yeah. But it's important to have a second opinion on it to make sure that you're not buying a dud, you're not buying a lemon and all that. So, and, and equally, I think people get scared because we're talking like about buying properties all around the country. Um, buying a property in um, in 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 Perth and you're in Melbourne, or buying a property in Cairns and you're in Sydney, like having the second opinion from a pest and building inspector or whatever gives you confidence to go, hey, like even if I went through a property in my local area, I'm not picking tapping on the skirting boards to hear the termite rattling through. Um, I'm not filling up the shower with my hand and seeing it leak out underneath and, and all those sorts of things. So I think it's important wherever the property is to get that and that doing your checks if you're buying interstate and different locations is, is a lot of peace of mind. So, yeah. What advice do you have for someone who's interested in getting started in property investment, but they've got limited resources, like even now trying to understand like, if they're located in Melbourne or Sydney and, you know, they want to purchase in Perth or Adelaide or, you know, or, or, or far North Queensland, because, you know, you're throwing around these, these crazy rental yields and, you know, you're yeah. getting me excited, but I'm scratching my head like, where can I go? <laughs> yeah. what, how can, how can we learn about this? Yeah. So look, I think we're in a world today where, you know, like 20 years ago, I started, I bought my first property 20 years ago. Um, there was no internet, there was no realestate.com, there was no Facebook, there was no Google map, there was no YouTube, there was no podcast, there was no nothing out there. So now we're literally armed with all the information we could want or need or, or find out there. Um, so yeah, education, listening to podcasts like this, going out there, researching, um, asking the questions. If you're not familiar with an area, just go to Google Street View, just keep driving down that car, right? Push the button, step by step by step. <laughs> Look for graffiti on the walls, look for stuff like that. Um, speak to other people that know the area well, have the local knowledge, tap into that, ask five real estate agents the same question about the area. Um, the obvious one would be to call us up and have a chat with us, but I'm not either, you know, sell the services, right? I'm going to give you a call Nathan. <laughs> call Nathan, right? Yeah. Um, but there's lots of resources out there. So don't be too caught up like australia is a very large place right like um someone said to me that i had a on, on my podcast i had a a, a job like a, a demi demi graph one of the guys that talk about all the population growth and all that stuff right i forget what his specific term was was but um we're talking and uh, if you think of australia australia's continent is like the size of the usa right it's a massive place right and we've got like 20 five 27 million people here they've got like three four hundred million people in the us so we're a big part of land like australia doesn't consist of the suburb that you live in right australia is a massive place there's lots of coastline there's lots of farmland there's lots of forests and mining areas and different things like that and we're a very rich nation and there's always things that are happening um there's lots of things that are happening out there um you know whether it be green energy things. I just saw the budget come out the other week and it, like in one location that I've been buying heavily in, there's actually $20 billion worth of infrastructure going in there for hydrogen, right? And shipping out hydrogen to other countries with deep ports and stuff like that. So it's knowing, you know, the market is researching the market, seeing what the potential is for that. And um, yeah, just just knowing that Australia is a much bigger place than, than where you live. And I think a lot of people make the mistake that have to buy for comfort. Um, yeah. In 2003, I was 18. It was the end of 2003 going into 2004. I had this girlfriend at the time I was dating for a few years and we went for a holiday. Right? There was no Google map, nowhere to research this stuff. So we went to the Gold Coast and um, went to all the sea world and stuff like that, right? And I said, I heard of this place, right? I heard of this suburb. And it was like the rough area of Brisbane. 
And uh, I, I spent like days, just kept driving an hour to get there from the Gold Coast and checking it out. Graffiti, houses, burnt cars, whatever. And I was like, I'm so excited by this stuff. And the chick, she was like very upset. And I'm like, come on, this is fun, right? <laughs> no, I'm with it, obviously, right? But yeah. um, with it, these properties were like $60,000 at the time. And I've seen that Sydney had boomed, right? In 2003, the market peaked, boomed, and bust, the bubble busted in Sydney. And this just goes back to like, why would you buy it? Like, how do you get over the fact that something could have been worth more in the past? Not every market is like is concurrent. They're counter cyclical. So Sydney might be going up, Melbourne might be going down. Melbourne might be going up and Queensland could be coming down. And I didn't realize that at the time, but I'd seen that Sydney had fallen off a cliff and the Sydney market crashed. Stuff that was selling in Sydney for 300 grand in 2003, in 2008 was selling for like 200, 220. So it had lost 20% of its value yeah. in like five years. Yeah. Um, and no one talks about it. It's a very long time. It was 20 years ago. Like, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> time yeah. flies, right? When you have having fun. Yeah. And, uh, but in the Gold Coast of Brisbane, that market had just taken off and I didn't know, right? And I had these opinions. So these were the three things that I thought at the time, right? So I found these properties for 50 to 60 grand. They were renting for like 100 to $120 per week. So 10% yield. And I said to myself, the market in Queensland doesn't go up, right? Because I'd heard of horror stories from over the years. So it doesn't go up. Um, Units, townhouses, and villas don't go up in value, so I didn't buy them. And if I went to the property and I needed to change the tap washer or paint it or something, I couldn't just readily get to it. So I didn't buy based on that. The market saw for the years after that, so from 05, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, those properties went up from 50, 60K to 200 grand to 240K, right? Went up four or five times, right? Then from about 2010, that market crashed to about 2015. And you can pick them up for 150 grand again. I started buying at that point, right? But in the years from 08 to 2016, Sydney boomed because of the GFC. Monetary policy became easier. It was cheaper for debt, debt became cheaper. So the prices were able to go up. And um, I always look at that as a massive opportunity cost. And the funny thing is, and I can say it today, is that townhouses and units go up a lot. Um, I have a, across my portfolio, I've got probably 25% to 40% of strata type of properties have all done very well. So what I've realized is that over the years, strata properties go up. Um, I've made a lot of money on strata properties, but maybe like 25 to 40% of my portfolio. It's changed like depending on how many properties I'm buying or what are the new properties that I added in my portfolio. They definitely go up in value. Queensland has really well performed. And I'm not a tradie. I don't want to go and change. I don't know the last time I went and renovated a property. I don't even know where half my tools are. I've done work on my properties, but I'm not a glorified tradie. My job is, my role as an investor is to make sure I'm buying assets that are below market value with good growth and good cash flow. So, um, yeah, I think it's important to have a strategy. And there's lots of ways to make money out there. I'm just sharing how I've made my money and the sort of properties that I've bought over the years. Um, but there's lots of ways to make money. I don't sit here and I've built one house out of like, I've probably bought about 300, probably sold maybe 40 properties over the years. I don't buy properties to sell them because I've never had anyone call me up over the last 14 years of business and say, hey, Nathan, I'm so happy I sold a property 10 years prior. They're always like, I wish I bought more. I wish I didn't sell. Yeah. Yeah. Place and all that. Um, I'm just a lazy buy and hold investor. It takes a lot to accumulate all the assets, so selling them off isn't you know the greatest thing uh, out there. Um, out of the properties that I have sold personally, of like forty or fifty that I've sold over the years, I reckon half of them have continued to go up, and I've missed out on that growth, which I'm fine with because I bought them with the purpose of doing. Um, and the other half, I can buy back for the same money, so it's like I sold at the peak. But my strategy is just buy and hold. I don't go and build houses. I don't go subdivide. I don't go and like the time and energy to go and chop a block of land up, build another house on and all that. I could buy five more properties and hold them. Most people that are buying, renovating, building, selling, flipping. So you could have two investors side by side. One of those investors 
could buy, they could have 200 grand each or 100 grand each. One could buy a house, renovate it, sell it, make himself 200 grand in the year. Happy days, good, all right? At the end of the year, they bought it, they renovated it, they flipped it, made 100 grand. Cool, all right? They've got money sitting in their pocket. Inflation means that money's going to buy them less than what they bought last year. And nine times out of 10, the value that the property has gone up hasn't been because of their renovation and they're so great, it's because of everything else that's gone up in the area as well to support that price. Um, with the other person, they could have bought with 100 grand or 200 grand, four or five properties that have gone up from 200 grand to 250, pulled the equity out of those four or five properties, bought another um, you know, three or four properties, be it five, six, seven, eight properties at the end of the year, the growth of those properties has increased the net worth position, their cash flow is increasing. And if those properties all double, everything doubles in the next five, 10 years, well, then the person that still owns is going to benefit from that. The other person doesn't have the asset anymore and has now got a pocket full of cash and doesn't buy them as much. So. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> mate, it's, I think people definitely have to be reaching out to you because it's like the way I know I'm, I'm listening to this, you make it sound bloody easy and, and you, but it's more, it's, I know I say this, but it's just, you've been doing this for the last how many years, how probably what, 20, over 20 years. 20 years just, of buying. So, and now you're able to just provide so much, so much value and, and the numbers like, it, they're just wild. They're honestly wild. Now, yeah. now, in this, in, now this next question is: How do you manage risk in property investment? And are there any specific strategies or precautions you take to mitigate potential losses? Yeah, I guess risk comes at all different areas, and a lot of people are just looking at two-dimensional risk constantly, right? So I talked about just a few moments ago about opportunity cost as a risk, right? Of me not taking action on certain things. So I think it's important to look at every part of you know the upside and the worst case scenarios and the downside. And if you have a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, a plan D, very important. So at the time of buying my first property, so the first one I just went out and bought something relatively close to where I lived and then I kept buying. Um, I had the fears of the GFC uh, I've seen layoffs, I've seen interest rates rising, I've seen a massive recession, all these bad things. And it was around when I got to about number seven or eight that I realised it was a bank game. It wasn't Nathan wanting to buy whatever property he wanted to. It was like, I need to keep the bank happy. If the bank's happy, they're going to keep giving me money and I keep buying things. So I came up with these three ideas which help me minimise risk greatly. One was to buy it below market value. So if you buy it below market value, say it's worth 250 or 300, you buy it for 200 you're making equity from day one. So that's going to help you get to the next deal, but also you're taking the risk off the table that if the market took a dive and you know, shit itself, that you, you could sell it and get your money back without getting you know, too much shrapnel through you. Second one is to make sure it's got growth potential. So how do you define what could have growth potential? Um, the people need to be able to afford to pay. Like I look at areas where they've got a house with no eaves and the house the two family incomes, you used to have one household working, now you've got a two household working. You drive through the areas and you're like one and a half million dollars house with no eaves. Like how can this house ever go up to $3 million, right? What would cause that to double? That would mean the income significantly increase or something, but everyone stretched at the, at the edge. So buying in areas and locations where the income can support future growth is very, very important. So if you're buying for 300 and everyone's on 80 grand, yeah, sure they're not on 150 grand, 120 grand, 80 grand, that 80 grand income can support a price of $500,000 for a property. So I wanna make sure that there's growth drivers from the bank's lending, um, as well as you know infrastructure projects and you know things for people that wanna to come to those locations for. Um, and the final one is I wanna make sure the cash flow is neutral to positive across the property purchase. So if you're buying a property that's negative cash flow, a lot of people out there speculate the last three or four years, they think they're gurus out there and they've been buying properties for the fun of it and they didn't have a plan, they didn't have a strategy. Now interest rates have gone up and inflation's hitting or whatever. You know, in your area, has your property gone up? Has it gone down? How can you survive through any market? If you're buying properties for 200 grand, 
300 bucks a week is going to cover an interest rate up to like 10 percent or, or whatever right and you're not going to get underwater too easy and at that point there's going to be lots of government incentives so like people that are paying 300 bucks a week it's the bottom end of the market so there's always going to be rental assistance government assistance something to assist the, the people you buy probably with a two grand a week rent well then there's a an issue there yeah so um that is crucial to help support like your property portfolio is neutral cash flow and then let's say like what we're seeing at the moment like i manage a lot of people don't realize i manage thousands of properties you know in these locations that i buy um i've seen in the gold coast i was talking to a guy today and he didn't have his property managed through me right and uh i asked him like what's your rent on your property because i thought it was wrong on my form and he goes 315 dollars per week and like mate that should be 700 bucks a week right <laughs> So like the rents have gone up like considerably, like double and triple in a lot of instances. But if you have a property that's neutral cash flow today and you can put a rent up by 50 bucks, 20 bucks, right? 20 bucks this year, 50 bucks next year, 30 bucks the year after, there's a hundred bucks over three years. That's a hundred dollars net cash flow in your bank account every week. So if it's neutral to positive from day one, then the risk is sort of taken away from it on the table and you can push for you know, lots of positives and what are some common misconceptions or myths about property investment that you've come across? Um, houses go houses go down in value. The land appreciates. That's not the case. Um, uh, a lot of people think like the area, the location, the land size. Um, you know, people buy land and then they're getting stung with land tax. They have to pay lots more in building insurance and stuff like that. So. You know, there's a pro and con to to all these things. I think a lot of people get caught up in the media, get caught up in taking guidance of friends and family. And most people, you know, aren't really that, how do I put it? It sounds great. Um, they're not that savvy when it comes to money, right? They're taking their advice off their uncle that's broke and destitute and they're taking advice going, oh, you shouldn't buy that. And I always think like, if you do what someone's done, you'll get what they've got. It's the actions, the repetition, right? If, if we sit there and smoke all day and, you know, go out and party and stuff, that's not going to have long-term effects that are good for us, right? If we fit and we're eating healthy and stuff like that, like the actions are very important. So having, you know, once again, it comes back to having that clarity. Um, I think if you've got clarity, you can, the noise that comes in from other people doesn't really you know, affect you. So just emotions the emotions the biggest killer for people it's just their emotions they're scared whether it's fear or whether it's ego fucks them up so yeah i think that's uh it fucks people up you know in pretty much everything when you look at people how the way they invest in in stocks or or whatever it is it's um yeah they're always getting caught in the hype or the fomo of something and uh <laughs> it's uh it's it, i think that's one thing it's very very hard even as humans to even try to control all those uh emotions and i think it's just experience over time um and, and you know i think well how do you feel with the current market because you turn on obviously you turned on the tv in 2020 and you know properties were going to crash 50 percent or 30 percent whatever it was and then it, we we just came out and we exploded and um, obviously, Queensland's gone nuts. Industrial property has gone chaotic um, yeah. as well. And uh, then, you know, you, you have a look and obviously we then through a bit of a downturn, you know, residential talk in, in Melbourne terms, a bit of a downturn last year. But, you know, but yeah. now there's no, not, not much stock. And then you, you turn on the news and interest rates are flying up and we're hearing about that there's going to be all these distressed sales. So, there's going to be all these fire sales again, but you know, I don't it. know. I'm, I'm kind of looking at the market, and uh, yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, they, uh, me personally, I think it, it, we're we're decent. Uh, we're looking mm. decent. What are your thoughts? I'd love the market to crash. That'd be like, you know, we'd do celebration, right? We'd be doing the the, the rain dance for it, right? For it to crash because you can opportunity to pick up things on sale. Um, but it's not the fact, right? So I take it back, like you said, everyone was writing and putting out the media, right? The funny thing is, is that the people that are putting the news out in the media, what did they own? 
right? I've been in the media. I've been on TV over a hundred times, right? I don't go on mainstream news at all because I can't, I can't lull myself. I can't lull my, you know, my 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 thoughts to put something out there that's not good, right? And the people that are putting out this content, they don't own shit, right? So what reference, like, there's lots of things. I'm just here talking today about property because I fucking know a lot about it, right? But I don't see you talking about health. I'm not here talking about politics. I'm not here talking about science. I'm not here talking about mechanics or engineering or anything like that because I don't know shit about it, right? But I know what I know, and I know that the people that are giving those topics don't know shit either, right? And they're taking directions <laughs> and orders, and it's like it's very... I question, I question everything that I'm hearing out there, right? And conscious thinking is something that people don't have, right? A lot of people don't have it. It's it's much more needed. They don't want us to be critical thinkers because we're questioning things and we're not obeying, right? So it's critical thinking and questioning the system and questioning all that without going on a tangent too much. But when we look at it, mathematics don't lie. Numbers don't lie. Our emotions can lie. Emotions can give us ego and greed or fear from, you know, uncertainty. But if you have the facts and you have the inputs, if you add the inputs into the system and you go, well, the inputs don't mean what the outcome is going to be. And yes, anything could happen, right? Like thinking about in 2019 that we're going to be locked in our houses and forced to prison and all that sort of stuff. If you sit sitting here thinking that's, you know, that's not something that will ever happen in my country, right? But it's like it does. And the system doesn't want everybody to be critical, free-thinking beings. It doesn't want them to be successful. Because if you're not successful in that system, you're dependent on the system. And property yeah. gives people a bit of an option to be more self-sufficient, more self-reliant on themselves, and not so much needy on the system. So uh, the system is designed to keep us trapped in it. And all the stuff I see now, I know from being on the on the news and on the TV, like it's all about the advertisers, it's all about who's spending the money to promote certain things on there. And it's like... I've been told, I've been hosting shows and having a little thing in the ear and then it goes to an ad break and then the other co-hosts are like, oh, so what's really happening out there? Okay, we better stop talking because the advertisers won't appreciate it. It's talking and stuff. It's like, hang on a second. Like, there's a fucking, there's a glitch there in the matrix that we're seeing. So, <laughs> um, so my views on it is it's got to add up and what's adding up isn't one trillion dollars worth of debt that the government's got. It's not that 31.6 trillion the US has got. It's not that we've got trillions not trillions of dollars worth of household debt it's not that people are sitting there um getting after pay to buy freaking food right there's big issues out there in the financial system and inflation is the only answer because they've got to print more of this worthless money and it's going to push up the values of everything and the assets anything apart from money is going to go up and i love property because you don't just have the asset that goes up but you've also got the cash flow that goes up and you can pay off that worthless debt that you've carried with the cash flow that's been increased how do you balance your time and resources between managing your property investments and you know growing your business? Um, sometimes I feel like if I focus more on my portfolio, I can sit here and say I've got a thousand properties, not like two or whatever <laughs> yeah. today. Um, but uh, you know, it's like the, the plumber that has a half finished plumbing job in the house and the mechanic with a car that's half repaired. Uh, I do feel like I put a lot out there into my business, which, you know, is good, but I could be more putting it into, you know, I've got to split my energy right. And I think having great people, having great systems, every business has great systems, every business has great people, has great strategy and whatnot, your investing needs to have the same thing applied to it. So treat your investing like a business and you'll be, yeah, nice. you can scale it. Can you discuss any networking or relationship building strategies that have been instrumental in your success as a as a property investor and entrepreneur? Um, keep good relationships with people. I don't. I, I'm actually like funny thing. I went to five high schools. I couldn't make friends. I was too scared to talk to people. Right. So I'm cool chatting on a podcast. I'm cool talking on a TV camera because I'm just talking. But I don't like being around crowds of people. So I don't actually go out and network with people. I don't have yeah, interesting. Like, a book full of you know, elite people that I, you know, that I could chat to. So um, it would be good if I did. Um, but at the same time, I like to be self-sufficient. So um, having good contacts and having good people in your, in your circle, um, everyone needs to know your dream, your goal, your vision. And if you don't know it, then how can you expect other people to understand what you're trying to achieve? So getting the, the foundations right is very important. 
but having a good accountant. Accountant that's good doesn't mean that they're going to get you down to paying no tax. An accountant's going to help you with tax, help you with asset protection, but also help you be able to service with the banks. A, a good broker is very important. A good lawyer is very important. So having good quality people on your team, uh, if you've got someone that's good that can help you get there, then great. If they can't help you get any further, if they've told you no, you can't do anything further, then you've outgrown them and you need to go seek what you need. And most people get told no and they just go, okay, I'm going to step back a step and not do something. But every time I get told no, it's like, well, fuck, you can't get me yes. I need to go and find someone that's going to help me get to yes. What do I need to? Most people, if they're servicing, if the bank says no to money, it's like, okay, you can't get a loan today. Well, tell me why can't I get that loan? What's holding me back? Oh, it's your servicing. Okay, how much do I fail servicing by so I can go and fix that? And they're the sort of questions and people you need to be able to help guide you and push you to the next level. So. Nice. Have you ever considered investing into other areas other than real estate, maybe shares, bonds, crypto, anything like that? Yeah, um, good question. Like, I call my business Be Invested. I didn't call it Virtue's Property Company or anything like that. Um, I'm an investor fundamentally. I invest in all different things. I invest in crypto. I invest in businesses. I invest in uh, other sort of financial instruments. I built a solar farm of my own. Um, I, I stack precious metals, all these things that I invest into. Property is my favorite go-to because it's leverageable. Um, you can't go get a loan on um, on a lot of things. You can't go on, um, well, not that I'm leverageable, but my LVR across my portfolio is less than 10% debt across my property portfolio. That's all I have today. At the start, it was like 95 and 90% sort of debt levels, but it's very low today. But I'm looking at liquidity on the other side of the transaction. Who's going to have the money to be able to buy something? If I own a billion dollar asset, I've only got five people that can afford to buy it, right? So my market to exit that's going to be small. So I like very liquid markets and having the ability to leverage it means that there's a lot more people out there to be able to buy. It. Um, and the thing with property is that you can leverage it, but you've got the growth of the asset, you've got the growth of the cash flow. Um, when I look at shares, I don't have any paper assets. I don't have any shares. I have no interest in shares. I have over 80 companies that I run. I didn't even realize until I was doing a podcast one day, I own a fucking Chinese restaurant. There's a fun fact. I own a Chinese restaurant. I saw dim sims, fucking curry prawns and rice. I don't even know what sells there. I don't even know the prices, nothing, right? But I bought a resort and inside the resort was the restaurant and then the restaurant it's successful. It's a very popular one. It's in Cairns. And uh, I think about maybe a half a million dollars a year worth of revenue, profit, sorry, from a Chinese restaurant. Nice. Now, I've seen me over a bowl of rice cooking it or anything. <laughs> um, and I can do that and get a business that makes money. Or I could go and invest in the shares. And you look at the shares and these companies, there's so many zombie companies out there. The businesses that have borrowed too much debt, like the banks are going bankrupt. We're in a world in 2023. There's been a half dozen banks drop already. They're dropping faster than lots of other things that drop, drop suddenly out there. And if you can't trust a bank to survive, there's meant to have money. How the fuck can you trust Afterpay? How can, the, how can you trust any retailer that's broke? Like all these businesses, their books are cooked. Their books are fake. They're, so I don't invest in that stuff. I invest in the crypto. I like crypto. Um, I invest into food and energy and commodities. I love that. I love being self-sufficient. I think everybody should be investing. You might sit here and say, oh, what can you do if you've got $1,000 to invest? Go get yourself access to food. You can remove your grocery bill each week. I live in a unit. I've got clients that live in units and they send me photos of their vegetable vines that they're growing on their balcony, right? These things that you can be doing to invest in that you don't, you can cut expenses from your lifestyle. It's just always something you can be doing always it's just about literally breaking it all down and just and and just running with it but you know majority of people they're just kind of lazy it's just easy just get on uber eats and uh <laughs> and load up and, yeah i feel i'm young but i feel like i'm like i don't want to i don't want to participate in that you know like it's like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't subscribe to these things yeah yeah it's wild and uh nathan just final question you know, obviously you were successful very young and um, you've now continued on. Like, what does the future hold for you? Yeah, good question. Um, when I first, like, uh, I guess everyone's definition of success is, is different. Um, 
when I first started investing, I thought it was literally impossible to get to 10 properties. I wanted it, right? I pushed myself and I was like, fuck, if I'm not working hard when I'm young, I'm going to be forced to work harder when I'm older, right? And if you're, if I'm young and I'm like 18 and starting out, I don't have the need for kids and misses and dependents and all that sort of stuff, right? I can streamline my expenses and run for it. So I had that on my side. So I thought if I work two jobs, I used to work two jobs when I was younger, before I quit at the age of 24, um, I just did whatever I had to do when I was younger to build myself up. I look back now and I think if I could find the 18 year old version of myself, I'm like, I can think harder, right? think bigger, right? All these things. But, uh, you know, I could only do what I could at the time. Um, and for me now, like I've hit a lot of level of success, but I still think there's a lot more that I can do. So I'm not playing for me. Like none of this is for me. I, yeah, I can give content out and, you know, people can benefit from, which gives me a lot of fulfillment from. But then I always think like I'm playing for my kids, my grandkids, my great grandkids, right? And they're the, like, I want to leave something. Life's very fast. It goes like that. And we all see that at some point in our life. And for me, I just want to know that I can leave something to help, like that guy change something in our lives, right? And I hope that I can give stuff to other people that, you know, knowledge or share something that's that's been a part of that. So uh, I said I had a goal of being a billionaire by the age of 40. A lot of people keep asking me like, hey, you track me with that. Uh, I'd say I'm probably 25% of my way there uh, to get there. Um, and I've only got about two years left to get there. Uh, I did say whilst I was 40, so it could be three years if I want to calculate the year of 40. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm doing everything I can to get there, but you know, it's much more bigger. Like I don't even look at money. Like I hate money, but I hate the context of money. Um, I can do that from doing nothing because just inflation is going to increase the value. Right. So there's monetary aspects, but then there's like what I can leave legacies. Um, when I first started the business, there was, um, you know, it was cool. Like there was only like a couple of my staff and that. I look back now, I've got hundreds of staff that I employ. Those people could be working for anybody. They could be doing anything, but they choose to be here. I've got a commitment to that, right? And I want to make sure they're achieving the things that they want. A lot of my staff are investors. A lot of my staff are, you know, doing the same things they want in life. So I get a, a kick out of seeing people achieve their own greatness. So that's, that's something that's important to me. Um, I think as the older I'm getting, the more closed off from the world I'm being and the more self-sufficient and, and you know, back to the land sort of thing. Um, but yeah, who knows where the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years will go, but uh, I'm just having fun. And I think if I was to sit here today and think about half the things I think of, or you to show me the person I was going to be today, 10 years ago, even, or five years ago, I'd be like, who's that bloke? I don't know him, right? And I've grown and had to evolve to become the... A lot of people just think that they can get somewhere by thought or an action, or they deserve it to come to them. But I've realized I've had to change who I am to get and receive what I'm trying to receive. So you need to be the person that can take possession of what you want and your actions need to be in line with that. So yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years where, where that'll take me. But yeah, it's, it's a good question. Nice, nice, man. I, I think yeah, even you provided in an hour and 15 that we've been running, you provided a lot of value. So I, I definitely think you, 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 you tick that box, which is amazing. You got two years to be a billionaire. Come on, Nathan. I, I reckon you got it in the bag. I reckon you got it. Even if it takes you another five or, or ten, whatever it is, you're right. Uh, We'll get there. <laughs> we'll get we'll there. Go. But I feel like if I if I express what I'm going to do before I do it, and if I don't do it, I feel like a dickhead. Eh? Like I feel like people like so. I think a lot of people are scared. Like sometimes when I speak to my investors for the first time, they're like, "Oh, I don't want to say what my goal is because I think it sounds silly. I don't want you to laugh at me." And they're like, "What is it?" It's like, "Well, I want to get a hundred grand a year." And that's probably the most common thing is to re remove themselves from a job, right? Yeah, and. Uh, Money can personify things, right? If someone's bad without money, they're going to become a bigger dickhead. If someone's good, they can do more good with that. And uh, I think a lot of people don't like, sort of throw it out to the universe and, and speak about it and talk about it because it's shamed or whatever. And I think yeah, when I, I throw those things out there, I've got a commitment now to make it happen. No, well, I think it's I think it's amazing because yeah, you're right. Like people 
people were scared. I think it's, I think people were scared to actually say that because then their close friends or family or whoever they're actually telling is laughing at them. And then they feel insecure um, about it. Or like, okay, maybe I can't do it when really it's anything's, anything's achievable. And um, it's, it's, no, it's actually amazing that you put it out there. And that's probably why um, it's, well, it's a big, probably a big reason why that you are where you are. And, um, you know, the manifestation, a bit of everything. It's all, it all has to play out. And you know what, even if it takes a little bit longer, um, you know, it's, it's, you set yourself, you set yourself ambitious targets and, you know, it's, yeah. you're going to get there, which is, um, which is really cool. And I admire it a lot. As a final thing, like, I think also like we can sit here today and go, you know, there's success or whatever behind what I've done, but each level of the story that in each chapter, like there's this saying, I think it's like, can't judge a book by the chapter you're walking on or whatever, right? Like there's different chapters to our lives and different things that we require, different version of us that needs to show up. And, you know, like whether it be someone that's single, someone that's committed, someone that's got a family, like people have had to grow. People need to change and evolve to level up. And as, as, a, as a business owner, as an investor, I've had to change who I am at each level to keep growing and to be able to hold it. And I think sometimes people get stuck at a ceiling and then they, they become, instead of a producer, they become a consumer and, and different things like that. So you need to be reassessing yourself on an annual basis, really, and even on a monthly basis to go, am I on track? Am I, do I have enough clarity around what, do I, what I'm trying to do? Do I have enough you know, focus on what I need to do? Is there something I'm missing? Is there something I can, re, can be refining? So, yeah, it's just continuously becoming a better version to the level that you're at, the, the season you're in. Bloody oath, bloody oath. And uh, Nathan, I, I really appreciate all the value you provided today. And how can how can people find you or get in contact with you um, or even just, uh, uh, even if they wanted to maybe listen to your, to your podcast, I'll obviously chuck it all in the, uh, down the bottom, but I don't know, any, any plugs, uh, where can they... Well, I appreciate that. Um, I guess the, the, the easiest way, like someone wants to get started with their journey, uh, they can reach out to my team. Uh, I, I personally work with my investors. So if someone comes on to be a client, I am the one that buys the property, locates them, they deal with me personally. But I have a big team because I can't do everything. So I've got to let some things I can leverage, some yeah. things I can <laughs> my advice I give, but my I don't handle paperwork and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think probably the first step would be call the authors, one 367 uh, My business is called Be Invested. Um, I put a lot of stuff out there on YouTube, uh, podcasts on Apple Play, uh, Google Play, Spotify, stuff like that. It's, it's called the No BS with Virtue Podcast. So I just throw it out there uh, on a weekly basis. Um, I do Facebook Lives and all that. Um, if someone wants to get started or just to ask in a message to my team, just send us an email at admin at beinvested.com.au. And one of my team, if they... They're very good, like my investor relations guys, they'll think, okay, if this person needs help with finance, I'll put you in contact with whoever. If it's a question that comes through, they might run it past me and say, hey, I've got this situation. What do I suggest and what sort of guidance can I give? And then I give them feedback and they reply. So send us an email at admin at beinvestor.com.au. We'll go from there. Amazing. Nathan, once again, thank you so much for all the value provided. And uh yeah, well, uh, definitely got to get you back on sometime down the track. I reckon once we hit the target, a, a celebratory <laughs> podcast. <laughs> whenever, you're ready, whenever you're ready, I'm, I'm, I'm here. So I really appreciate it, Christian. You've been uh, very uh, hospitable and appreciate having me on your podcast. So yeah, appreciate that. And you're a Thanks, mate. Your viewers have gained something. So I appreciate that. <laughs>